What's up, YouTube? This is Too Raw for TV. So, in this particular video, I want to talk about the late great Connie Hawkins. All right, uh, Connie Hawkins is a Hall of Famer and one of the great innovators of basketball during the 1960s into the 1970s. Um, he was known for, um, along with Dr. J, a little bit later, David Skywalker Thompson. Um, his, his generation of athletes were known for bringing a different style of basketball into popularity. Sort of like how players today like James Harden, uh, Steph Curry, Klay Thompson, and, and before that, Ray Allen, maybe Reggie, but it, it really started accelerating with the ending of Ray Allen's career and then that generation I just mentioned. They brought the three-point shot into popularity for today. Connie Hawkins' his generation brought popularity from an NBA game that was much more conservative, a basketball game that was much more conservative in nature, a more grounded game. And uh, they changed the attitudes about the dunk. You know, prior to them, dunking in an NBA game was viewed as uh, being arrogant, uh, showing up the opposition, um, unbecoming of basketball. There may have been some racial overtones behind that because black players, black athletes, and this is nothing racial, it's just a fact. Black athletes, brown athletes, tend to be more athletic in, in many areas than white athletes. Uh, so they were more akin to being able to dunk. And I do wonder sometimes if that has some racial overtones, considering the fact that uh, Wilt Chamberlain was able to dunk from the free throw line when he was in college in Kansas, and that was banned. And as many of you know who listen to this video, Crib Dil Jabbar was banned. Well, really, it was Kareem, but the prevailing notion was that, you know, no player would be allowed to dunk in the NCAA during the 1960s. But many people feel this was aimed at Kareem, keeping him from being even more dominant than he was. But ultimately, it just, it just uh, allowed Kareem to refined his sky hook to the point where it was the most unstoppable shot in the history of the NBA. But after this, uh, players like Connie Hawkins and Julius Irvin and many others uh, made the, the high-flying act of the dunk the most popular thing going in sports. While Connie Hawkins is a Hall of Famer, he was never able to live up to his expectations. Connie Hawkins should have been one of the great players in the history of the NBA. Probably not just top 50, but maybe top 30. But he was robbed of time being played in the NBA due to a scandal, a point-shaving scandal that he almost certainly really had no involvement in. But due to the strict anti-point-shaving uh, rules in the NBA at that time, he was banned. For many years. And due to early uh, knee problems, he had to retire prematurely. But Connie Hawkins still will, is remembered some five and a half years after his passing as one of the all time great pioneers and the sacrifice that he had to take uh, for his career. Ultimately, he prevailed. Connie Hawkins was born, I believe it was in 1942. He was born in 1942 in Brooklyn, New York. And um, he was born in the Bedford-Stuyvesant section of Brooklyn. And it was there that he attended Boys High School and played for coach Mickey Fisher. Hawkins soon became a fixture at Rucker Park a legendary outdoor court where he battled against some of the best players in the world. Hawkins did not play much until his junior year at Boys High. 
Hawkins was all city first team as a junior as boys went undefeated and won New York's Public Schools Athletic League PSAL title in 1959. During his senior year, he averaged 25.5 points per game, including one game in which he scored an amazing 60 points. And boys again went undefeated and won the 1960 PSAL title. Hawkins then signed a scholarship offer to play at the University of Iowa. This is where things got tricky for Connie Hawkins. During his freshman year at Iowa, he was a victim of the hysteria surrounding a point-shaving scandal that had started in New York City. Hawkins' name surfaced in an interview conducted with an individual who was involved in the scandal. While some of the conspirators and characters involved were known to or knew Hawkins, none, including the New York attorney at the center of the scandal, Jack Molinas, who was later shot to death, I think in front of his home in 1975, I believe it was, had, had ever sought to involve Hawkins in the conspiracy. Hawkins had borrowed $200, or the equivalency of $1,800 today, from Molinas for school expenses, which his brother Fred repaid before the scandal broke in 1961. The scandal became known as the 1961 College Basketball Gambling Scandal, despite the fact that Hawkins could not have been involved in point shaving because as a freshman, due to NCAA rules at the time, he was ineligible to participate in varsity-level athletics. However, he was kept from seeking legal counsel while being grilled by New York City detectives who were investigating the scandal. And as a result of the investigation, despite never being arrested, despite never being indicted, Hawkins was expelled from Iowa. He was effectively blackballed from the college ranks. No NCAA or NAIA school would offer him a scholarship. To add insult to injury, the NBA commissioner at the time, J. Walter Kennedy, let it be known that he would not approve any contract for Hawkins to play in the league. At the time, the NBA had a policy barring players who were even remotely involved with point shaving scandals. As a result, when his case was eligible for the, uh, when his class excuse me, was eligible for the draft in 1964, no team selected him. He went undrafted in 1965 as well before being formally banned from the league in 1966. Because of his in a, in a, his uh, inability to play in the NBA, uh, Hawkins played one season for the Pittsburgh Wrens of the now defunct ABL, a minor rival to the NBA, and was named the league's most viable player. After the league folded, Hawkins spent four years playing with the Harlem Globetrotters. During this time, he filed a $6 million lawsuit against the NBA, claiming the league had unfairly banned him from participation and that there was no substantial evidence leaking him to gambling activities. Hawkins' lawyers suggested that he participate in the new ABA, which came of age in, I think, 1967, as a way to establish his talent level as adequate to participate in the NBA, as well as having an immediate source of income. As a result, Hawkins joined the Pittsburgh Pipers in the inaugural 1967-68 season of the ABA, leading the team to a 54-24 and record, and the 1968 ABA Championship. Hawkins led the ABA in, in scoring that year and won both the ABA's regular season and playoff MVP awards. The Pipers moved to Minnesota for the next season, and injuries limited Hawkins to 47 games. Hawkins had surgery on his knee. The Pipers made the playoffs despite injuries to their top four players, but were eliminated in the first round of playoffs. Following the playoffs, the Pipers franchise moved back to Pittsburgh. That had to be frustrated. From Pittsburgh to Minnesota, then from Minnesota to Pittsburgh. Now see me, me being a dude who love cold weather and snow, I'd have loved to live in Minnesota. Yeah, I'm a backwards nigga. You know, I, most people love warm weather. I can't stand it. Give me goddamn snow. Give me fucking cold. Give me 34 degrees cold. I love it. Love cold air. Uh, anyway, Hawkins lawyer Rosalind Littman and her husband, fellow lawyer S. David Littman, who was the brother of the Wren's owner, 
filed an antitrust lawsuit against the NBA in 1966, arguing that the league and its owners blacklisted Hawkins. The NBA had refused to allow any team to hire Hawkins, who at the time Littman started working with him was still playing for the Harlem Globetrotters. And um, the league paid Hawkins a cash settlement of nearly $1.3 million, or nearly $10 million in today's dollars, and assigned his rights to the expansion, Phoenix Suns. He would be assigned to the Suns as a result of them winning a coin toss over the Sonics. Although the Pipers made a courtesy effort to resign him, playing in the NBA had been a lifetime ambition for Hawkins, and he quickly signed with the Suns. By this time, by 1969, Hawkins was already 27 years old. This is a man that probably should have been in the league by the time he was, what, 23? But he had already missed about four years of what would have been an NBA career. So, just do the math. He's a 20-plus point-per-game scorer, may have averaged between 24 and 27, maybe even 28, 2,000 points a season. Well, let's just say he had some injuries, right? So let's just limit it to 1,800 points or 1,900 points on average. Multiply that by four. What is that? Uh, 5,600 points. So you look at his NBA career, Give me one second. Now, actually, it's ABA and NBA combined, but if you look at his NBA career, he scored 8,233 points. So if you add that total... That's uh, 5,000 extra points, right? So, that's what, 16,000? And he had to retire at age 33. So, if he was able to play a little bit longer, he could have cracked 20,000 points, theoretically. Hey, he could have no. cracked 20,000 points. Not to be broken. But anyway, spoken with an oath, swear. Or sealed with a even though he was, a, years, even though he was an old 27, so ad popped up, excuse me. Even though he was an old 27, he hit the ground running with the Phoenix Suns where he averaged 81 games, well he played 81 games, excuse me, and averaged 24.6 points, 10.4 rebounds, and 4.8 assists per game. In the final game of his rookie season, Connie had 44 points, 20 rebounds, 8 assists, 5 blocks, and 5 steals. God damn! The Suns finished third in the Western Conference in the 1970. NBA playoffs, they were knocked out by the Lakers in a seven-round Western Conference semifinal series in which Hawkins carried the Suns against a team that had future Hall of Famers, Chamberlain, Baylor, and West. In Game 2 of the series on March 29, 1970, Hawkins led the, the uh, Suns to a 1-14-101 victory while scoring 34 points, grabbing 20 rebounds, and recording 7 assists. For the series, Hawkins averaged 25 points, 14 rebounds, and 7 assists. So look at that. This is a guy that can do it all. Playmate, rebound, score. I could I, the way he the way it sounds, he sounds like he could probably play today. And now you understand why I've made comparisons between him and Giannis Antetokounmpo. He missed 11 games due to injury during the 1970-71 season, averaging 21 points per game. He matched those stats the next year and was a top scorer on a per-game basis for the Suns in the 71-72 seasons. In 72-73, his average dipped down to 16 points per game. After the 72-73 season, Hawkins was traded from the Suns to the Lakers for Keith Erickson in a 1974 second-round selection. And that season, uh, 
he would average 11.3 points per game. Afterwards, his level play kept going down and down and down, and the uh, knee injuries really began to take a toll on him. And after the 74-75 season, he played one season with the Atlanta Hawks, in which he averaged career lows that year. Uh, he only averaged uh, 8.2 points and 4.6 rebounds, though he did play in 74 games. But after that, at age 33, he had to call it quits. And, um, you know, you do wonder what type of career he could have had had it not been for the injuries and had it not been for the fact that he had to miss so many years of what would have been an NBA career because of a bogus uh, rule. You know, he was not connected in any way, meaningfully, with the point-shaving scandal, but he was essentially black blackballed because of guilt by association. He knew criminals, but that didn't make him a criminal. And like, you know, the, the article says, how could he have been guilty of point-shaving if he wasn't even on a, he, he couldn't have played. At the time, freshmen were not allowed to play in NCAA uh, athletics. They weren't allowed to play in varsity games. So how could he be guilty? It, it made no sense. It was stupid. But um, despite that, he was still inducted into the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame in 1992. And um, it was back in 2017 that Connie Hawkins passed away at the age of 75. But he is one of the great, great players in the history of the NBA. Uh, for his career, he played in 616 games, averaged 18.7 points, 8.8 .8 rebounds, 4.1 assists. He shot 47.9% from the floor, 16.1% um, from three. Remember, there was a three-point line in the ABA. and was a 78% career uh, free throw shooter, so he was a good free throw shooter. Uh, as far as his resume is concerned, he was an ABA champion in 1968, ABA playoffs MVP, 1968, uh, was the ABA MVP in 1968, was a four-time NBA All-Star, ABA All-Star in 1968, All-NBA First Teamer, 1970, two-time All-ABA First Team, 1968 and 1969. He's on the ABA all-time team. His number 42 is retired by the Phoenix, uh, the Phoenix Suns. He was the ABL MVP back in 1962. And uh, the all-ABL first team in 1962 was voted Mr. Basketball USA in 1960. First team parade All-American in 1960. Scored 11,528 points, dished 5,400, excuse me, dished 2,556 assists, and corralled 5,450 rebounds. The late, great Connie Hawkins, never to be forgotten. And like I said, man, this guy could have had an NBA career from 62 to 67. You know, you, you really look at it, man. The guy should have, he should have had at least, he should have had at least 17,000 points in his career. At least. And that's pretty impressive for a guy retiring at the age of 33. And with the uh, advancements today with the knee surgeries, you know, back then, man, it was gruesome. They opened up your whole fucking knee, man. You know, and he was robbed of a lot of his athleticism prematurely, so... If he could have played until he was 36, that's another three seasons. I know I'm doing a lot of woulda, coulda, shouldas, but he should have had 20,000 points in his career. And that's pretty impressive without a three-point shot. But anyway, tell me what you guys think.